Hi, everybody. This week on the interview chair, we have none other than Mrs. Nancy Martin. Sit back and relax. Hi, everybody. Today on the interview chair, we have Mrs. Nancy Martin. How are you, Nance? Fantastic. <laughs> I called you Nance. <laughs> it's okay. I've been called a hell of a lot worse. <laughs> and even recently. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so what, what have you been up to? Uh, before uh, we start, let's catch up. We haven't, I haven't spoken to you in a long time. so. Well, you know, so I've been in the uh, self-imposed prison being married to the mafia. And so, uh, yeah, I've, been lo- I've had the chain attached to the leg. And so uh, the chain is off the leg now. Yeah, you know, um, there's so much. I mean, I, I knew we knew going to, but there's so much stuff you couldn't do. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, that was. So anyway, I did a sweepstakes this weekend um, at the Cascade Hound Show. Did a bunch of sweepstakes in the groups. And then a um, couple of sweepstakes coming up. So I'm uh, able to act like a civilized adult now. Are you going to go forward with that? Yeah, and- yeah. Oh, I'm going to bite the big fat bullet. Excellent, excellent. Okay, yeah. let's begin then. I already saw I saw Brian on the weekend, so I don't need to ask how he is. So he's good. <laughs> he's fantastic. So he's cute fun. with his beard. I know, I know. I can't. I can't grow that. It just comes in all patchy and white. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The first question: Tell me how how old you were, and how did you get involved in our sport of dogs, Nancy? Well, how how old I am now? Nobody cares. <laughs> so I was. Uh, we were like every family, you know. You do what everybody does. You go to the well. At the in those days, it was called the dog pound, and you know we got the proverbial dog pound dog, which that thing was a colossal disaster. It um, it opted to no longer live with us by jumping through the kitchen window at the mailman. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that, and so. She made, she made a fast return with her stitches to the shelter. And then we my father made the classic example of all mistakes that everybody does. He's got, you know, the pet store, this little cocker spaniel, which had every genetic disorder and it died at like eight months. And so wow. finally, yeah, it was it was a disaster. So we had the first two disasters that a lot of us all do. And then we thought, you know what, maybe we should like get a, a real dog. So of course, then nobody knows anything. And I had seen, there was a TV show when I was in like first grade because I was um, 10 when we got our first dog, a purebred dog. Um, It was called Buckaroo 500. And it was actually a 15 minute, like these days we don't see that, 15 minute TV program. And it was on like from 12 noon to 12.15. And I used to run home from school, jumping all the neighbor's fences and cutting through the yards to get home from school to watch this. Because the guy had a trained pony and he had this trained Doberman and her name was Dixie and she did all these amazing things and he used to say Dixie sit on my knee and he would back up and kneel and she would back up her little wiggle butt sit on his knee and she would jump on the horse and hold the reins and I was like okay we got to have one of them so uh we looked in the newspaper and we bought this Doberman which was not a great one but she did have some champions in her pedigree And my father was a very successful labor union attorney in New York. Interesting stories about that. And he was at the time like president of the Bar Association. So one of the local attorneys, you know, they chatting, you know, what are your kids doing? Oh, we got a puppy. Oh, we got a puppy. Oh, well, we show dogs and you should go to the puppy show. So Donald books them. So uh, we... Oh, so we signed up for the match show bulletin and I took the little classes and then we go to our, so the first dog show we ever actually went to was a Doberman match and somebody I grew up with, went to school with that um, lived locally, who also has Dobermans that some of your viewers may have heard of. Her name is Gwen. Her and I went to our first dog show together. Wow. In nine, yeah. And like How about nine, them apples? Oh yeah. And we were both about uh, 11. And uh, I just want you to know that I was first in junior showmanship. 
And uh, I just want everyone to know that. And I remind her that, <laughs> I remind her that regularly. But anyway, that's... I would that's start. Yeah, oh, yeah I, I torture the hell out of her. But I'm, it's just interesting. So that's how it all started. So then, of course, we got the bug. And then and when uh, she went to a different school and then a couple of high schools in our district, then she moved a couple of towns over. But in my high school that I went to, Marilyn Mishira, Marilyn Biggs, was... Um, she was a teacher there, Brian's friend. And um, so she got us more involved, you know, joined the club, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so that's that. So then we, of course, had to breed our dog because that's what everybody does. And we were we were really fortunate that we bred to a dog named Chip in Evanaeus Gridiron, who, whose litter was a litter mate to Touchdown, which is Mary Beth's dog, Mary Beth's oh. you know, Right. That was a very famous litter. Bred by uh, very famous local people, Evan Air Kennels in, in the same town we lived in growing up. And so we were really lucky um, that we bred to a champion our first time. You know, we were lucky. And then, um, so we had a kind of a cute red bitch. Well, then that was it. We were off to the races. So then we bred her the second time to a dog owned by Terry when Terry was with Pat. We bred to a dog named Lador's Fanfare. And that was owned by Terry, Terry Lazaro. And so then we had a puppy from that litter having trouble with one of her ears. And she said, well, why don't you come, you know, come up for the summer for a couple of weeks or whatever. We'll try to get that ear up. And uh, my mother wasn't too crazy about me going away for the whole summer, but she farmed me off for a couple of weeks or whatever. And then um, the rest is history, right? So I started working for Terry. And that was right when she went out on her own from working for Stebby. And then um, when Pat, moved in with joy and I went to work for them. Um, that's how I got in the gym. I went to work for um, Terry and then I met Pat Lawrence and then I went to work for her and joy uh, that next summer. And that's how I got into the chins. Wow. Yeah. So that's, um, well, how old uh, were you at that point? Um, I was 11 when we went to our first show. So I was about 12 and a half, maybe 12 and a half when I went to first work for Terry. Wow. That's young. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, 16, like 1969, yeah, mm -hmm. 68. Yeah, so a few years ago. Yeah, it was a few years ago. Yeah. Okay, keep going. So then, of course, you know, the mother of all mothers who eyeballs who she thinks, and Janie says to me, when, hey, kid, you got some good hands. You want to come work for me? So, <laughs> duh. <laughs> And uh, so um, I worked for her a little bit that one summer. And then the next summer I worked for Bill for a little bit over some of those summer shows. Um, Cause I was actually still, uh, I did a little commercial modeling when I was younger. And so I didn't want to leave that money cause that's how I paid for showing the dogs and the horses. And uh, I did ride on the side too. But anyway, so I worked for Bill a little bit and then Janie finally said, you you going to come or not? And so, uh, that's that. And then work for her. And then uh, the rest is history. No. How long did you work for Janie? So I worked weekends for a couple of years and lived up there for um, about a, uh, about eight months on and off. I, I still was working at home a little bit. So I, I had to keep doing that little commercial modeling. And um, so then that was towards the end of their career, obviously. And then, um, you know, it was kind of a transition, you know, Elliot and Bonnie and Mark. I mean, it was an interesting bunch. When I worked and lived there, I lived with Dave and Erica McCurley, mm -hmm. 47 Classic Road, Woodbury, Connecticut, just not like I didn't remember that or anything. And uh, it was an amazing bunch, you know, Elliot, my God, you know, and Mark. And I mean, just it was just an, an amazing, amazing bunch. I bet. I bet, you think I, I bet you have some good stories. Oh, yeah. My favorite of all, which I have never, ever told anybody. And I, I had. Well, sort you can of, just tell me. I won't tell anybody. Yeah, well, I, I had, well, I had. I, well, it's a great story. I had decided to keep it if if uh, if and when Forsyth got roasted. But it didn't happen. So what's so the story? Well, it's a great story. So. They were, you know, they had their moments and we had a, we had a bad crew and Scott, I was actually working with Scott. Uh, it's, it's a long story, but there was a, there was a couple of young, not so great kids that were there. And um, we, you know, Janie had the freak pen and, you know, you put 940 dogs in the freak pen. That's that's, you know, this big. And um, that particular pen had a smaller clip. And I kept saying, you got to be careful which clip you put on that pen. 
And so one of the kids puts the smaller clip on and, you know, we have this Carrie blue bitch and she pops the pen open and all the freaks in the freak pen are now running all over the dog show. Right. <laughs> exactly. It was a Rock Creek Kennel Club. So I sprint like a lunatic to the front gate because it was a fenced in fairgrounds and I'm screaming, shut the gate, shut the gate. Because I figure, you know, if they're loose running around the fairgrounds, they're loose running around the fairgrounds. We're going to get them. Yeah. Okay, so they, they shut the gate. Well, you know, Bob and Jane are showing up in the station wagon with the wooden paneling on the side. You know, Janie with her shoes at nine o'clock, right? And we've backed up the entire dog show now. And we caught them all. Why? Because none of them had been exercised yet. So they all had to stop for the obvious reason. We caught all of them. And I'm like, Phew. then we get back and get together. And then I run back and tell the guy he can open up the gate. But in the meantime, Forsyth and Janie are like second in line. And they're like, what's the holdup? You know, we got dogs to show. And the gate guy goes, some guy named Forsyth, all his dogs got <laughs> 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 oh. So they come in and they're like loaded for bear. And I'm like, everything's handled. We caught them all. They're all exercised, you know. But we kind of held up the dog show for about 15 minutes. But yeah, that was that was a classic. <laughs> That's what went through his head when the guy said there's some guy named Forsyth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bluebird. I mean, God. Yeah. But I said, hey, I caught them all. Perfect. And you showed them all. <laughs> so there you go. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a great story. No harm, no foul. Yeah. <laughs> so what year did you leave Bob and Jane? So um I went out on my own as soon as I turned 21. I actually I actually had a license. I had a limited license. So that's how long ago this is. I actually had a license. And uh, so probably uh, 74, okay. 75, give or take. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So a few years ago. <laughs> and, and let's go on. What happened from there? So. I was on my own for about, uh, you know. Um, Did you stay in the area? Yeah, I stayed on Long Island, right, right. Um, for about seven years, I was on my own, and I had a, a a really great client. You might remember that on that Gordon Setter dog I showed, that uh, Autumn McGregor dog. Cool. Um, you may remember, but anyway, um, they were really, really great clients. They owned a grooming shop and a, like a dog store and stuff. And, and I used to get a lot of, you know, pet clients and stuff, teach them how to show their dogs and stuff, tra training classes and stuff. Anyway, they owned a really nice, something from Helen, a real nice dog was the dog that I won my first group with as a handler, which was at Chagrin over Glassford with Boxer. <laughs> Exactly. It's amazing how we remember those things. Isn't oh, it? I remember that. Um, so anyway, um, they uh, they were really uh, looking to buy a kennel and really get into the dog thing or whatever. And so um, we used to get a lot of people who came into that grooming shop and it was a really high end feed store, which which was sort of a big thing then. Now it's you know, there's a lot of them. But then that was really a big thing on the, you know, on the North Shore of Long Island. So we had one lady who came in one day. She said, you know, we used to recommend breeders and hook people up with breeders and get, you know, good puppies sold to people. So she wanted a bass now. So we bought, I bought her this really nice dog from Ann German, Tally Ho, which was sired by one of Ryan's family's dogs. And then um, I had a major on the dog and then she had a stroke and was, you know, unfortunately incapacitated in, and then and it was over and so then the dog had to find a home and I thought well maybe they'll know because Ann didn't have a thought maybe they'll know it's sired by one of their dogs so I uh, looked up Brian's father in the judge's book you know and called and said hey I have this dog sired by one of your dogs and unfortunately the lady is not you know not she's not going to be functional again and she can't keep the dog do you think maybe you have some so it it worked really and Ultimately, they had just had an inquiry for somebody in South America. And uh, so that's how the whole thing started with him. So that's how I really got. Now, you, you brushed over a lot. That's not just how you started with him. Let's, let's hear it. That's how we really met. Well, that's how you met. But yeah, that's so we met that way. Right. And then. I'm um, not going to say the end. <laughs> no, well, no. We met that way. Right. And then. Um, well, no. It's not the end. <laughs> no, well, no. Apparently not. It's uh, 37 years later or whatever. But um, so we. 
obviously got knowing, oh, I'll take you. Thank you. Okay. So the whole thing happened. Well, then I think he was a little sly because then he sent me a dog to show because clearly he would need a handler in that breed. Yeah. There's no question that he could never have done what I could. <laughs> what have a done. sly guy. Exactly. So he was he really wanted to finally start winning. Yeah. So he sent me a dog to show. And uh, that was obviously, you know, a reason to call more often. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so that was that. And uh, now here we are all these years later. You're yeah. brushing over things pretty easily. <laughs> well, it wasn't very exciting. <laughs> I mean, we met him, him, long him distance sending for... you a dog to, yeah. and here we yeah, are, and then that was basically years later. It. Well, it was, you know, it's pretty boring like everybody else. You date, and then you get married, <laughs> and then you move on. But, um, but he was running the horse show business at the time which is why I moved to Chicago because at the time he was, he was doing the Warshaw superintendent thing. And, um, and so it was just easier for me to move there, you know, cause he would have not, that would have not worked. And so we did that together for about five years until it just got to be really, you know, really difficult um, to do both, you know, show dogs and stuff. Cause he wasn't going to be a handler. He, you know, he was going to do the horse show thing, which he was. And um, anyway, that, we got a couple of nice bass and hounds in and then that was he just was like I, he couldn't stay home. So anyway, then then obviously we did that for 150 years and then until we can't walk and now here we are. So yeah, it's um <laughs> this we got married in eighty three, so it's a long time. Yeah. And and so so that from eighty three to now nothing exciting happened? No, nothing. So uh obviously we ch- we showed a lot, a lot, a lot of dogs and um, obviously, you know, a lot of winning in Bass and Hounds. Um, I've had group invest in show dogs in every group. And, um, he, you know, he he I mean, he really wanted to show us Bass and Hounds, but uh, which obviously he did, you know, to some degree of success. And um, <laughs> I always said that um, I never when I first went to work for Janie, one, of course, you know, she has, I mean, still the last five senses she ever made is still hanging around. You know, she used to make you steal the toilet paper and I mean, it was great stuff. <laughs> but, you know, it really taught you a lot of good stuff. And um, so I thought to myself, you know, as a handler, one, not when the licensing stopped, one thing I never want to say, like if somebody calls you and says, hey, I have six Irish wolfhounds that need to go to the dog show this weekend because I you know, broke my toe and can't run. You should never say no. You know, so you have to have facilities and you have to have a vehicle because, you know, Janie, she would say no to nothing. And, and she always had the opportunity to fill that that void. And so that was really important to me to be, you know, have an, enough knowledge with all those other breeds to be able to do that. And um, and so um you know, we showed a lot of, as you know, a lot, you know, a lot of odd breeds. Uh, I got just sort of, just sort of happened early on um, where, you know, I just, just got a really good one in a kind of an odd breed. And then I sort of got tagged as the odd breed queen. Um, but I will say one thing about that, you know, uh, just because it's a lesser number breed doesn't mean the dogs are less quality. Oh, sure. And in reality, in a lot of those lesser quality breeds, as far as you know, numbers, they're actually better. And, uh, you know, because it's not diluted. Right. And, uh, and so, um, I always, and the other thing is, I think, as you know, you know, as a professional, you know, you, somebody's first drink, second or whatever, if, if you have an off breed, you know, like a Chesky Terry or something, I mean, the chances are you being number one string with a Chesky for, you know, for somebody big, like, you know, like Gabriel is probably slim because of the choice. But right. if he made the choice or if somebody said, you know what, this is like really a great one of whatever breed and I'm going for it. And so that's what I did. And, um, you know, I made a really big point to go to home countries, spend a lot of time in Poland with showing those Polish lowlands and a lot of those other breeds, Canaan dogs and all that. And, um, you know, um, you know, we finished a lot, a lot of those breeds. Spinoni spent really a lot of time in Italy and, you know, in all Europe showing him and the world shows and a lot of time in Europe for my German clients. We had quite a few clients out of the country. And so, um, I've shown dogs in, you know, lots and lots of countries. We had clients, uh, 
you know, that lived in the Virgin Islands. We had a Ridgeback client down there. We used to go there and, you know, look at what they had. And, you know, we had uh, a lot of Australian clients, a lot of Japanese clients for Bass and Hounds and Sammies. So, you know, a lot of traveling. I mean, I've shown dogs in a lot, a lot of places and Brian's done seminars. And so I feel like I, I you know, I had a real good luck and real good fortune of a very global view. Oh, for sure. A very, very global view. And so, uh, yeah, so that went on for uh, 40 years. And um, finally, we were like, oh, God, you know, we can't run anymore. And so Brian had been a large R, which is a steward's position at the horse shows. Um, so when, when Brian decided to be the field rep, it, you know, it was an easy transition for him at the time because he had been a large R at the horse shows. And so... Um, we, you know, we were thinking, well, in the next couple of years at the time, we were going to have to back off, though, because, the you know, the 50 dogs at Chicago International Days were, you know, over. Oh, my God. Right? Yes. I mean, the last year we did that, I literally I literally almost couldn't drive home. I couldn't get in the car because I couldn't bend my legs. Right. And right. I was like, this has to stop. And so um, that's really, you know, how it happened. I mean, none of us want to quit. We just can't run anymore. Can't keep going. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So then the, the moving here thing, you know, was sort of the next progression um, after showing dogs. But, um, you know, I showed um, a lot of breeds that really mean stuff to me, you know, like like for yourself. You know, I love the chins, right? And, you know, I mean, showing yeah, the, the chin lady. Of, yeah, exactly. You know, I love them. And, we, you know, we still have them. We still have that little old lady. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of breeds that we really enjoyed, you know, I love Welsh Springers. Loved showing that breed. I love Springers. You know, there's just a lot. I mean, I love the Spinoni. I mean, those are just amazing, amazing dogs. And that was so much fun early on, you know, to show those kind of breeds. And, um, you know, just a lot of those breeds that we got to really do. I love the Canaan dogs. You know, everybody looks at you like you're crazy. But Bryna, you know, she's just the most wonderful, crazy little Canaan dog lady. And those were they were fantastic. And just a lot of that stuff, you know, um, we didn't show a lot of terriers, you know, but um, the ones that we did, you know, were, you know, like Midge had that wire dog we showed and stuff. And, um, you know, we showed wire hair dachshunds for Midge. And um, I had some really, really interesting clients that I showed dog for a lot of people may not know, but I showed Harlequin Great Danes for Chubby Checkers. Oh, wow. That'd be cool. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah, he was really great. And I showed for um, J.P. Parisi oh. when, he was New, when he was a New York Islander and then yeah, when he went yeah, to Minnesota. He was a great I, player. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Now his son is really, really uh, famous. Yep. 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 I, saw, I actually sold them a Doberman puppy from a litter I co-bred early on. Her name was Fiette, which is, means little girl in French, in French, right, Canadian. Oh, I didn't know that. So I got, then I wound up, you know, I went, <laughs> this is the best story. You'll get this because, you know, you're a fan. I also showed for uh, Neil Anderson when he was a Chicago Bear. And um, so we had a lot of those local ones. But anyway, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about hockey at the time. This is probably uh, probably about 19. I was right on my own. So maybe like 75, 76. And um, so oh. he comes, you know, they come home for the summer, right? Didn't come to start camp. And he had, they had a five, she was about five and a half months old, this red bitch, and she had to have her ears taped and stuff. And I met them because they came into this dog store that I worked at my, you know, my clients. They want to get a breeder recommendation. So anyway, we sell them this puppy. So they're like, well, why don't you come to the house and tape the ears? Okay. So I go to the house. Well, you know, this is like the day before training starts. Like there's Pat Price and Mike Kaziki and like all these like, really and, and i mean these guys are all laying around the pool and i'm like oh <laughs> shit. this has worked out pretty goddamn good so yep now i'm dating pat price <laughs> right you know and uh yeah no it was like really crazy so then i was like really into the hockey thing because i had this great client and i was you know i was dating pat price right and then uh then i met a whole bunch of the, all those old athlete friends uh a, a lot of guys that paid, played canadian football that you know they all knew each other whatever and next thing i know i'm showing a dog for this canadian football guy it, it was nuts and so that was really really fun I bet. Really, yeah. really, really fun. Yeah. yeah. And so then when JP moved to Minnesota, we I had been married. Brian and moved to Chicago, and I still show dogs for him there. 
Well, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't realize he had he was that active in showing dogs. Yeah, I mean, I showed about three dogs for him yeah. uh, over a period of time, and then um, uh, then they got a Springer, which which from a breeder, and then we finished. Then they had two Dobermans and a Springer that we showed. But yeah, that and that was really fun. And for um, Rottweilers for Neil Anderson when he was a Chicago Bear. Wow. And um, yeah, so that that was really fun. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and of course, Chubby Tekas was like the best. <laughs> it was just so great. You know, he'd call you from like traveling or whatever, and I, I'll send you some picture. But um, before me, he did have one dog that was shown, and it was this is a long time ago. Barbara Jarmaluk showed Chubby's first dog. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, now that's a story, right? And so um, I finished uh, two Harlequin Great Danes for Chubby, which was really really fun. And then you know we'd get you in concerts and stuff and. Yeah, that was always really fun. Oh, for sure. so, I mean, I've been really, you know, those are really fun people to show dogs for. Yeah. Yeah. Like eccentric, you know, exotic. So and I think that was, that was really a fun time. <laughs> and then uh, when, when I married Brian and moved there, um, then I, I met the Germans at the Sammy National when they came to Wisconsin and then started showing that's like, you know, 25 years ago, started showing dogs for them. And then when ponds were going to be recognized, they had them too. I'm like, it's time to start getting the ponds going. So we had a, a couple of clients from other countries that were um, really, really good clients that we had dogs really consistently for, um, which was also a lot of fun. Well, you did so well. With, I remember you winning with Sammy's and Chins and Swinoni, and I just remember you winning all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have shown... Uh, I've shown a lot. I've shown, I don't know, I have to count, but it's it's over 15 best in show Sammies, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, which is, and, you know, um, I don't even know how, you know, I, who knows about the other ones, um, obviously a lot. But what I will say is um, I feel that um, within the sport, you know, um, I was able to do that one thing I feel that I wanted to do, which was like never to say, oh my God, I, I can't, I don't, I don't know how to do that. You know, and then, you know, you clip or the, jacket on a terrier or something because you don't know what you're doing right like i never did anything like that which i was really happy about and always tried to learn you know really like from the mother load how to do those breeds right and i think that's why i was successful with them more early on than the average person because i did treat them like first string you know if i had a spinoni that that was my sporting dog you know and and um so i feel like that was really a big part of it you know if you if you elevate them to the level of their quality not of the quantity of that breed being shown or people and now now like everybody has those garbage breeds as janie used to call them i mean i was the one that cracked the nut you know now everybody has one and they all win and they're good you know, a lot of those breeds are, look at Phil, right? I mean, this is, you know, and Danny and Janie was like, oh, it's a garbage breed. And I said, well, I don't think Teddy thought Bichons were too garbagey when they came in, yeah. nor do I think Trainer thought that Porties were too garbagey when they came in with Charlie, yeah. right? But I think it's your attitude towards the breed. And so I always try to look at the, what, you know, basically like you're supposed to be being judged you're supposed to judge that dog against the standard not against the popularity of the breed all right for sure right and that is a frustrating thing with a lot of judging and stuff too and a lot of other exhibitors just because there's 150 of one breed doesn't make the winner better than a, an entry of two it's true so uh, over the years, you've seen lots and lots of dogs. Um, is there any dogs that you weren't involved with that you would have loved to have been involved with or thought about being involved with? Yeah. So one dog, I will say that when I was younger, I was young because it was my first Westchester. When Traveler came and went best in show at Westchester with Joe Schellenbarger. I don't know, know the dog. I Tell me the dog. Oh, the Gretchen Hoff Columbia River. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. Yes. Tra I was like. Whoa. I was really, really impressed. And also very impressed at the time, because Dobermans was my original breed, but very impressed when Karina showed against Missile Bell, when Corky, the first time I saw that duel, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm like, you know, 13, 14, I mean, I'm like a kid, 13, maybe like a kid. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't know that Missile Bell, but she's kind of prettier in the face. I remember thinking, I, I, I think I could suffer showing that one, 
that I would that would be okay. And um, yeah, and then um, I did love the pug that Dandy's favorite woodchuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a really fancy dog. I saw um, him when I was a kid too, because Bobby used to come up to the to yep. the portion show once in a while. Yep. Exactly. And I always thought, and also, you know, Risto. So oh, when yeah. I worked for trainer, this is a great story too. Um, That's Mark, what I want. All great stories. Mark and Michael and I, and this was at the garden. And um, so we did the breeding on the bench, which of course is illegal, you know, but we snuck him in at night of, uh, you know, Risto's mother and father, right? That Mally V. Mr. Muldroon, you know, we had to service a bitch and hide that thing in the back and get the breeding done, which turns out to be, you know, the ultimate best in show dog. And um, I always thought he was really, really fancy, um, you know, because it was a, an odd breed at the time to do that winning, you know, but um, I, I always felt like that dog was really like a special dog. Mm. And um, also Luke's Peak, Crown Prince, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always thought that that was a pretty amazing animal. Wow. Yeah. That's some good dogs. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so what's happening now? If you were, I'll go back. I'm going to backtrack a bit. Um, advice for young handlers. What, what advice would you give a young handler? To maybe not get hooked into just showing dogs. Because our, our kennel was just a show kennel. Mm-hmm. Where we lived, um, you know, we could not have a commercial boarding kennel. And, you know, luckily we, you know, we had a lot of clients and we had, a, you know, a large enough kennel. I mean, you know, we could easily have 70 dogs in that, 75 dogs in the kennel. But today with uh, animal rights and, you know, the doodle thing and all these things we have over us, I think it would be, you know, really smart of any young handlers to learn how to show dogs, but not totally depend on that. And to make yourself where, because what happens is um, when you're starving and we all were young and starving at one time, you take mediocre dogs, you take dogs for clients that maybe that have been through other handlers, right? For a reason. And, um, but if you have doggy daycare or grooming or those other things, maybe not necessarily a full-time boarding kennel, because that's difficult when you're a handler, unless you have really good help. But you can do the other things. I think it's also really good mentally, because, um, you know, there's going to be some big changes in the future. And, you know, if the docking and cropping thing comes, you know, to a head, then that could be an issue with clients. And I think it would really be great to work with somebody and i also think you know they're all our society is a, it's basically a fast food society now and you know nobody spends oh, 10 years working yeah. Yeah. And nobody spends 10 years working for anything instant right. gratification so. exactly and and you know part of it is the juniors thing is you push them to win it's all about winning and i think it's all about you know what the important thing is it's five minutes in the ring of the 50 hours you did at home right and that has really been lost in translation because of a society. I mean, it's just the way it is. And, um, you know, I think kids should know that they need to spend a period of time. But the other thing is none of them have good business training. And, I, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to have some business sense and a good suggestion for them. You know, take a business course and you know, take some courses because. They're all terrible about, you know, billing or how to keep records or receipts. I was horrible oh. until someone helped me. I was horrible at it. So. Well, how would you know? And this is the thing is, if you have, just because you have talent in one spot doesn't mean you have it in the other. And a great example of a profession like that is doctors yeah. or veterinarians. They went to vet school. They didn't go to business school. And a lot of them are terrible because of it. Well, handlers, as you know, are the worst of all. <laughs> I mean, they're terrible, yeah. you know. It's true. When, when Alice and I first got married, she was sure I showed dogs for cigarettes and hockey tickets. <laughs> well, sometimes, well, these days, that might have been a better deal because yeah. cigarettes now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> See, I could have got your free hockey tickets. You never asked. Exactly. And good ones, too. But I think that's the big thing. And I, you know, I also applaud what, you know, what the RHP is doing. And in particular, you know, um, Carissa with the safe sport. Yeah. Because that's another thing, you know, all of, all of us, everybody has stories, right? Everybody. And either side of the fence, you know, whatever you are, whoever you are, where you've been, where you have. Been. Always has, everybody has something. You're right. 
everyone. You're right. Guys, girls, young, old, you know, gay, straight, LGBT. We don't care. Everybody has a story. And also bullying. You know, there's bullying against each other. You know, I remember Ricky said that, you know, he didn't think he could be successful as a handler if he didn't hate his competitor. Well, why? Yeah, exactly. Why do you have to hate somebody? I always thought I should never, I don't, I mean, you know, we all have people we have problems with, but I never hated somebody just because they were doing what I was doing somewhere else. Right. I mean, that is a ridiculous mentality. And I think that that's been really bad for the sport. You know, that there was a generation of people that worked for those people who were taught that. And I think that's wrong. I think if we, if you are secure where you are not financially desperate, like if you did some pet trims or you did doggy daycare, you took your education a little bit about, you know, like just a little course in accounting or something like this. um, And you had that safe sport. I think the sport would be a hell of a lot better. And I really think. It, it could be part of the education. I mean, you know, you used to have to have certain things to get your license. I know when I had my license, I had to jump through hoops. I had to show solvency. I had to have, you know, you had to have a bank account. I mean, they were had, you had to have a vehicle. But nobody ever taught you how to really run the business and how to really, and also how to care for yourself, both physically and mentally, because that's the other thing. I mean, this is a business that can run you down mentally. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And there's that's never really addressed. And uh, so my advice to anybody young would be to, you know, to really, really not put yourself in that position where you're desperate with six dogs in that van, you know, where you got to go to the show this weekend to make the rent, right? That's a really important thing. And, you know, we've lost a lot of people because of that over the years. And also that gives you burnout. So I think if if we can teach them to compartmentalize how to be successful in spots, it it has never been done that way in our sport. Those are great points, Nance. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, we, we always had health insurance for our health. I mean, dental too. I mean, shocking. But, you know, that was also part of teaching them. You know, I'll tell you, when Larry came to work for us, Larry's mother was my client and um, he came to work for us and, he, uh, he didn't want to wear a watch. He said, I, he told me he had an affectation for wearing a watch. And I said, I have an affectation for you not wearing a watch. And so it was a little for a while there, first couple of months. And then I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach him to want good stuff. So that the first year he came, he came in April. And that Christmas, we bought him a really, really nice Gucci watch. <laughs> Because we, we wanted to teach him, you know, to strive to, to have quality things and to reach a certain place in life, but also to teach him that the timepiece isn't just about keeping time. The timepiece is about stages that you can arrive to in your life and how they can be learning tools. And so we gave him a really, really expensive watch for Christmas, though, and, uh, which he promptly dropped in the driveway the next day. And then I found it. And I found it. And then... I didn't give it back to him. <laughs> then he was afraid to say anything. <laughs> but then we had a little sit down. I'm like, so where's the watch? I have, I, 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 I'm like, I have the watch. You dropped it in the driveway, right? He'll probably kill me for saying this. But what a life lesson, yeah. right? A life lesson. And those are the things in our sport really lacking. Wow, those are good points. Yeah. How about... We haven't discussed many of your mentors. We've discussed who you work for, but what about your mentors, Nancy? Well, for sure, you know, obviously Terry early on with the Dobermans and Pat and Joy, Joy for sure with the chins, right? And, um, and, and Janie and Bob, of course, and Trainer, you know, for sure. I mean, you know, Bill was just- (laughs) What a list. That's a great list. (laughs) It is. I know. It's kind of scary. It's true though. I mean, I worked for all of them. And- um, Amazing. And, and uh, yeah, really, in each one of them, I, I sort of wanted a specific thing. And, and um, and uh, you know, keep it, I'm still close to all of them, you know. Um, and also Betty, you know, she was great because, you know, being a veterinarian that, that was the wife of a professional, she gave me a real, you know, I got a real good education. I will never forget, as, and to this day, I can see it. When I went to the kennel, you know, to Westford Ho the first time on Lovett Road in Massachusetts, right? And I walk in, they take you in the trim room and, you know, Betty's like, okay, you know. And then you look at the Petri dish that, you know, Funkin' Wagner's jar with the ear. 
of a poodle in it, right, with the wrap. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, right? I mean, I, you learn to put that comb through there. And that I will, I, I can see that as vivid. I can even smell that formaldehyde to this day. Wow. That was a shocking visual. But I learned. Yeah, for and sure. I, <laughs> well, I didn't wrap. No, nobody got there, you know, because you wrapped it and didn't put the comb through and the tip of the ear fell off. I still uh -oh. can't sleep. I still can't sleep. Yeah. 55 years later, I still can't sleep. But that one thing also really taught, you know, it taught you. Um, unfortunately, you know, these are these are people's pets. I mean, even if it is a kennel dog, it is so, it lo somebody loves it for whatever the situation. But the reality is, it really taught me that the only thing that ever should matter is care. Yes. And that's it. The rest of it comes. You know, if you lose, you don't lose. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I, I, I really feel that that's, that is the thing that I really learned from Bill and Betty in just that one 15 minute situation. You know, this is, this is what happens when you're lazy and you don't pay attention and you think you're cute and cool and whatever kids, teeny boppers, you know, you're giggling or whatever, and you don't pay attention. This is what happens. And then I have to deal with it as the veterinarian. And then we have to deal with the client. And right. that was like an instant. I'm like, okay, that's never going to happen with me. And, you know, it was really important to me. Um, you know, we never had ever had do a dog die, which few people can say, and, um, you know, never had to find an emergency clinic on the road, never had a dog get loose and we never had an accidental breeding. And I don't give a shit if I didn't win one point in my career, that makes me successful. Sure, of course. Wow. And I think that that's what people should strive for. And that's what I got from my mentors. You know, it's really, that was really, 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 and Joy too, you know, really, really pounded into you about care. That needs to come first. You're right. The dogs always come first. Yeah, for sure. And that was, that's what I got from those mentors. So they were, it was an amazing bunch for sure. Wow. And that is, that's an amazing list, even thinking about it. Okay. So you're, 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 uh, what have you been doing lately? Can you tell me? I want you to tell me about the, the Fido pet food. So uh, when we were showing dogs, you know, of course, back in the days of pedigree, mm -hmm. and when we got so much free food, right? So we had an everyday veterinarian, um, and then Jerry Klein, you know, did our important dog stuff. And our everyday veterinarian was, uh, uh, Brian went to high school, well, it's long. He went to high school with the husband, but <laughs> he went to college with our, our first veterinarian, who actually also was our Welsh Springer client, uh, Dr. Molly McCullough was her name. And Bob McCullough was Brian's college roommate. And then they had a young vet working there that we really, really liked. And then when she went out on her own, we, we went with her. So about a year or so into her working for us, she came to do heartworms one day. And, you know, there's like 75 dogs to do heartworms or whatever. So she said to me, I'm just so surprised. Nobody ever complains about a bill. You know, they just get a bill and they pay it. And I'm like, well, if anybody's going to complain to get a vet bill, they'll have to find another handler. But we got to talking and what she said was, you know, people can't afford this. They can't afford that. They complained about the bill or whatever. And it made me realize. So what I said to her, well, like who complains about the bill most or, or in your practice, where do you see like a, 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 the problem areas? And it was like young couples. Uh, we can't afford the, the nail clipping. We can, okay. So then I said, well, what if I just give you a dog food? And then when you have people who, or seniors, then when they come in, you give them a free bag of dog food and that'll save them 40 bucks a month or whatever it is, or 50 or 100 or whatever. Yeah. And then they'll have that money to pay you. So this is oh, 35, almost 40 years ago. So we did that from our kennel. When we, you know, clients would send a dog with a certain kind of food, you'd finish it in 30 seconds and you'd have 50 pounds left or something or whatever. And we didn't need it in the kennel. We brought it to the vet clinic. And then all those years of pedigree, and then wherever we won dog food, we would bring it to the to the vet clinic, and that's what they would do with it. Seniors on, you know, uh, that were on fixed incomes, or like a young couple, you know, that has a dog that has some tragedy, breaks a leg or something awful, has a huge vet bill, maybe would have had to relinquish it to a shelter, but then we would pay for the food in essence, and so that's 
was like, we used to call ourselves the Good Sams. And so that we did from that clinic for years. So when I moved here um, to Oregon, and we chose to come here because my sister lives here. That's why we chose to come here. I had this thing about the pet food bank because we had done it essentially, but it's only dog food, through our vet, Dr. Roush at the time in Grays Lake. And so there's a program here that I found when I moved here because I didn't want to get in that, you know, in the rescue drama, you know. Um, it was called Animals on Wheels, where they partnered with every senior center and they home delivered the pet meals along, you know, alongside the people meals. And I thought, well, that's kind of what we were doing through the vet clinic. We were providing pet food for seniors that couldn't. So it was this little tiny program, but the concept was great. So I went and volunteered. I brought some dog food and um, I went and volunteered like the second week we lived here, which is eight years ago now, April 15th, or we moved here June 1st. He took the job April 15th. We moved here June 1st. And um, the second time I went, I had my East Coast crates in the car, the little chin size ones, mm -hmm. and some dog food in the back. And when I opened up the hatch to take it out, the one lady said, oh, my God, those crates. I never saw crates like that in my life. And I said, yeah, they're, you know, they're, how much are those things worth? And I'm like, uh, a lot of money. So she says, do you want to be on our board? <laughs> I was like, okay. So <laughs> next thing I know, I'm on the board of this, you know, animals on wheels things with a bunch of little old ladies from the senior center. And I'm like, oh my God. But the concept was great. I had to be so behaved and, you know, it's just not possible for me. But the concept was great. So... They did a little bit of a pet food bank, but it was it was really struggling and everything. And so I thought, you know, this is like amazing. Why? Because as a died in the wool, purebred dog person, right? Like I'm a dog person. That's it. Right. Like you, like we're a lifers. We have the hate, the breeders, you know, versus the rescue and breeders are horrible and rescue. We have that. And that is really also a problem for us, is that I could really blow this up as a purebred dog person and get support from our within our ranks where it's not rescue and it's not about breeding. It's about caring and it's about a niche product and a niche spot. So that's what happened. And so um, I've just been like nose to the grindstone. <laughs> And when I first started, um, they, the animals did about, it was doing about, um, about 3000 meals for the year for senior pets. When I first came here and the first couple of weeks, I, that first year, mm -hmm. and now we do uh, 8,500 a month. Oh, wow. right. right. So we, um, we have 14 senior centers and what we do with the animals on wheels portion of it is the um, they get an interview for home delivered meals on wheels. Everybody that applies for meals on wheels gets a home check from the social workers. And then if they have a pet, the research and it's not our research, this research is from uh, Meals on Wheels America, that as much as 70 percent of those seniors, especially homebound ones, get delivery of Meals on Wheels, not for themselves, for the pet, or to share with the pet, because they can't afford to feed it. And I'm like, you know, I'm like in the fetal position now thinking, how, how, how can this be? And all my dog show friends, of which there's a few, we have, this, we have the answer. It's a bag of friggin' food. Yep. And so I just started calling everybody saying, Hey, when, you know, when you go to the shows this weekend, can you bring an extra bag of food? I'll be at such and such a show or, you know, you know, donations or whatever. And it's a 501 C three. So the club started being involved. Um, and I realized there that this is the perfect way for somebody like me and all of us to be in a lane where even the PETA haters, they, they can't hate you. And they can't they can't say anything against you. Why? Because these pets already exist in the home. Nobody's buying them. Nobody's breeding them. They're there. And we're keeping them from going into the shelter. And, you know, Ingrid can hate us all she wants. 
But that ain't going to play on TV because it's not going to play when you have a, you know, an 84 year old. Like we got this one little old lady. I just love her. She's 84 with her little chihuahua who's like 14. Right. What could be bad? There is there is nothing bad. And so I've also learned with speaking when I do presentations, I I've learned to, when I speak like to police departments, I do a lot of social workers. I do um, Oregon Department of Human Services, all this kind of stuff. I speak and I train them to not can the dog. Don't get rid of the pet. Like if the person has no money or if they get arrested, don't take the dog away from the baby mama. Call me, we'll feed it, right? This is all of this, right? Because that's another thing that in our sport we did. I didn't even know anything. What would I know about going to jail? Although some people think I should. But nobody has any concept. You know, when you get arrested and they, you know, that come and get your five Rottweilers or whatever and take you off to jail. Okay. This is crazy. I'm like, leave them home. Well, you know, if, if, if we have an opportunity to feed those pets, because those count as relinquishment numbers against us. And, you know, the worst thing for all purebred dog people is shelter relinquishment numbers. Mm -hmm. Our fault is dogs don't have homes, right? So I started realizing all these things that we have to provide pet food for these dogs so that they don't get relinquished to the shelter. And then that that's not against us because that is what that's what the animal rights people use against us. Is that while you're breeding a litter of Irish setters or something, 12 dogs are dying in the shelter because you have 12 Irish setter puppies. Well, we know that's not true, but that's not what the general public knows. Right. And that's not what they're taught. Yeah. And so it just I just realized that this is really the way to go. So um, we have Animals on Wheels. We have a pet food bank. We have a veterans program. And then we have emergency response. And on the third Saturday of every month, we have what I refer to as our full service pet food bank and pantry. And we have... Everything, leashes, collars, toys, beds, flea like everything, right? That You name it, we have it. And food. And on a typical Saturday like this last Saturday, we traditionally go through over 4,000 pounds of food in just a five-hour period. And we've had a couple of Saturdays where it's been over 5,000. So we're essentially doing between 750 and 1,000 pounds of food every hour and about 1,200 cans. It's huge. And we're feeding about, I just did the numbers, we're feeding on an average of about 480 dogs on just that one Saturday and about a, about 220 cats. That's it is, amazing. Yeah, it is huge. It's huge. And so um, it's, we're easily going through 10 to 12,000 pounds of food a month between all the programs. And the really, the real interesting thing about this and how you can really see your metric of how this is effective and a real tool is in shelter relinquishment numbers. So we have about a half a million in our county. Our county shelter is a 50 dog. It's appropriate. It's about one dog per 10,000 10, or so people. We don't have five dogs available for adoption. Haven't, there's probably not 12 dogs in that kennel. I'm going there tomorrow. Why? Fido Pet Food Bank. So I did a study, um, you know, 3,714 other counties in the country. And I looked at all the other ones of a comparable population of a half a million. What the, I call their shelter, what the shelter size is and what your numbers are. And I got like a lot of them to send me their annual numbers in other states. You have a half a million population, there'll be 75 dogs in that shelter, right? It is an obvious cause and effect. And this has gone on now for a good solid five years. And so I really feel like um, it's it's a really a big answer. I mean, this this is a really big answer to an underserved and un, absolutely completely non-tapped resource that's needed. Wow, uh, that's incredible. And I, I applaud you. That's just it's overwhelming when you think about it that way, you know. It is. But you don't and think thing, about it that way. So. Well, we don't. And, and I didn't. I mean, who does, right? Except we did do it with our vet, and I did have the inkling. But what's so great is the support. So, like, a lot of the clubs, Clackamas Kennel Club, they give us money. A lot of the local clubs do. I also have a couple of judges um, that judge when they judge independent specialties. They have them write the check to us. Wow. 
Yeah, like Sue Lee. I mean, there's several judges that do that. Jane Howard, when she does a Sheltie specialty, they have us give the checks. So, and then, you know, a lot of these people, when I talk to them, other club members or people who show chairman that, you know, like uh, Cheryl Candace Way or somebody one time, she said, you know, we have meetings and we can't decide where to give money to. We give money to rescue, we buy vests or whatever. And they have a club meeting and they're like, hey, let's give it to Nancy. And I'll tell you, during our fires here, I mean, we've had the year here. Yeah. You know, we had the fires, everyone's had the pandemic, and then we had an ice storm. But during the fires, the purebred, I mean, I, I could start crying. The purebred dog clubs were unbelievable. Eastern Dog Club. I mean, all these amazing clubs around the country. Damer sent us money from her club. Polly Smith all donated to this cause for the fires. I mean, it's incredible because it's it's about helping pets, but it's really about us purebred dog people because this is what this is about. It's about being in a lane because in the end, every one of us started with a pet and every one of us still has one. Right. Doesn't matter how many dogs we showed, doesn't matter how much winning we did or didn't do, everybody's got a little old lady that they love, right? I mean, they were a little old guy. I mean, it's just a fact. It's just the way it is. That's how we started, and that's how we're going to end. And what what I think is so important is that's what shows through this kind of a program. And it is virtually bulletproof. You can't pick on it. Because all it does is support. It's like kids. Nobody can complain about kids needing food from food banks, right? Nobody complains. And nobody complains about, you know, donating for kids that need hospital work or whatever. It's the same thing here. Because I think it's become really cultural. And when I speak, I've learned to tell people when I do speak, like I just did a presentation for, I mean, I've done a couple, but I recently did one, right? you know, obviously right after COVID opened up a little bit. Um, it was a Zoom one for all the, um, for several police departments. And I have a board member, on a policeman on my board and all specifically. And also my county sheriff's department has three keys, one for each shift, and when those deputies are on patrol, if they see homeless people that need pet food or if there's a DV situation or a home fire or something or whatever, they come and they have the key and they can take whatever that person needs. Right. That's just amazing. And so I did the same thing with the probation office. I'm like, they go there. I never knew any of this stuff. So they go and do a home check. And then if there's no food, they'll call DCFS to come and take the kids. But if there's no pet food, they'll call the shelter and have them come take the pets. And I'm like, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. I can feed them for 25 cents a meal. Don't take them. But they didn't have the resource. So now all of my probation officers in this county, of which is 88, that work in the probation department, which is You're really amazing. <laughs> but they're like, oh, I ain't taking that Rottweiler because Nancy will kill me. <laughs> but, you know, this is the thing is and I'm really loud and proud about the dog show thing. So I'll give you a brief little thing. During the fires, I get a phone call. This is the Humane Society of the United States. And I'm like, they found me. We've been watching you. And I'm like, I'm sure you have. We're so happy with what you're doing. We want to give you money. I'm like, okay. But there was a local person. She got a bunch of people together and they were bagging pet food like in her garage. So I go there to pick it up. And there's like literally a garage in someone's house with the one light bulb swinging, you know, like, where were you on the night of? And I go in there and one lady's like got her dog with her and it's a cholo. And I'm like, my God, you have a cholo. And she's like, no, it's a Mexican hairless. I'm like, it's a cholo with a flop ear. She said, no, he's a Mexican hairless. I'm said, I said, okay. I know it's a Mexican hairless, but it's called a cholo at Squintly. And I know because I have judged them in Mexico. And then after I said that, I realized I'm going to die <laughs> with all these Humane Society of the United States people that are bagging food for me. And I just outed myself as a dog show person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, they were great because they get it. And that's the beauty of this program is it puts us in a plane where you can't hate it. That's great. What an idea. What a, what a job you're doing. Where, what, do you have an email people get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, so uh, our, our website is www.phytoanimals.org. Let me just also, write that again. 
www. Yeah. Www. Www. Fido, capital letters, F-I-D-O. It's Friends Involved in Dog Outreach, but it's an acronym. Uh, Fido and Emiles with a capital A, N-I-M-E-A-L-S.org. Fido and Emiles dot org. And it's Fido Pet Food Bank on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Okay. I'll get Ernie to put all that on on the screen while you're saying that. Yeah. And like really great, you know, Valerie, <laughs> like we've had really, you know, like Valerie uh, did a birthday. Michael did a birthday Facebook, you know, I mean, really good dog people. Valerie's done it twice. Wow. And Michael and Michael Faulkner, you know, it's just like you could just cry because it's really about us. Wayne, you know, Wayne's donated to me and, uh, you know, the so you've been there and Eddie. Up. Eddie came when he judged the Beagle National. He came and I gave him a tour of the warehouse. And OFA gave us a donation. Our refrigerator was bought by the OFA. Wow. I mean, this is just like, it's really, really about us. Oh, sounds great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you for that. asking. Um, one last question then. I, I ask the same question at the end of every interview, and I always have to. If you were to meet the 20 year old Nancy, is there any advice you would give her? Yeah, the advice I would give her is I would have gone to FIT for textile design and uh, not shown necessarily, not not done what I said I'm afraid kids would do. You know, you struggle too much early on. I mm-hmm. probably should have done that and made a little money and then, you know, been set up a little bit before I struggled, you know, early on getting going. And that would be the advice I would give is, like I said, you know, have a little bit of a backup. Don't just jump in with both feet, right? And uh, when you're more financially stable and you're not so pressured to take dogs to show, it's it's so much better. You know, it's it's unsafe driving because you're desperate to win and also taking dogs that you probably shouldn't be, which is not good for the sport, maybe for your pocketbook. Um, um, that That's probably the advice I would give. But I wouldn't change the way it played out. No, because you were... Uh... Pretty amazing. Still well, are. You. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had a few moments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't have changed that, but I, I would have liked maybe to, like I said, not be so struggling early on. But it's also part of what makes you good. Sure. You know, it's like young yeah. in a marriage, you struggle. But but there's just too many, it's too many factors about in our sport and there's too many eyes on us now. And that's a real concern. This has been great, Nance. I'm glad you did this for us. Well, I'm glad you asked. It was great to catch up with you and see you. I miss all of you. I miss seeing you. I know. I've seen you in ages. I know. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I thought I'm going to go to Clackamas this weekend. My God, I haven't seen these dog show people. I went to the show this weekend. I'm like, crazy. I haven't seen people in a year and a half. It's nuts. You know, for those of us who, you know, God, you go to 200 dog shows a year, you get tired of looking at those people, right? It's crazy. and But I also think, I will make one comment. I think that the, for me, at least personally, this pandemic, um, you know, and all the problems we've all had, you know, it, it has certainly given a lot of people pause for negativity. But for me personally, I think the positive self-reflection is that it has really taught uh, me, you know, everyone says when something happens, you know, you realize, something. but it really has taught me um, about a lot of good choices that I made that you really don't see. And also it's taught me to um, be very positive about any kind of small, little positive thing that happens on any given spot. And um, I think that's, that's also difficult in our sport because we're pretty hard on ourselves and we take whether we win or lose on the day with that client's dogs, we take that personally and we turn that into whether or not we're really a good or a bad person based on how good or bad your day went. And I think that that's really, I think I learned from this pandemic too, that, that, that there's always something positive that comes from every single day and that we should, we should dwell on that more than the mistakes that we've made or the, the maybe the opportunities we've missed. You are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate that was it. Great. You're not the worst guy in the world either, Will. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I loved it. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. That was great. It was great to see you. What a great interview. You're doing so much good for everybody. I can't wait to uh, get together with both you and Brian at some point. 
Uh, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. Don't forget, if you want to get a hold of me, go to hold me at willalexander.net, or you can send me messages to dogshowtips at gmail.com. Don't forget about the podcast, the, the Dog Show Drive with myself and Wayne on Spotify and Apple and all kinds of other forums. Until then, talk to you later.